is um, unique, powerful, exciting, an adventure. I think it's people coming together. It allows everybody and anybody to have a go. Even some shows you'll come across and you'll be like, I did not even know there was a market for that show. The arts have always been there, particularly theatre has always been there for me at the difficult times. I always have that desire of being a performer, but you're deaf. How are you going to be able to do that? How can you direct? As a blind person, I simply can't get into the venue. I've got to look at almost as soon that I can't get in. Spontaneity is very difficult within the fringe. They had a disabled toilet that was down two flights of stairs. The interpreter is normally put on one side of the stage. I feel like I'm watching a bit of a tennis match. When I experience these barriers, it makes me feel sad. Frustrated. Uneasy. Deflating. But sadly not surprised. Accessibility, it can become part of the artistic process. It's trying to bridge the gap between the two different worlds the hearing and the deaf worlds. What would happen if there was a blind Hamlet or a King Lear who was deaf? Talk to us, let us know what you already have and we'll let you know what we need and we can hopefully meet somewhere in the middle. I'm Michelle, I'm a producer. I have limited mobility and it's my fringe too. I'm Leah, I'm a stand-up comedian. I'm deaf and it's my fringe too. I'm Alison, I'm a director, I'm blind and it's my fringe too. I'm Neil, I'm a musician, I'm a full-time wheelchair user, and it's my fringe too. Everyone has the right to experience live performance.
Fringe stands for freedom, the freedom to take part, making a start, telling your story, whoever you are. It's for the risk takers, rule breakers, name makers, artists and audience alike, a place to discover and to be discovered. It's an international showcase, meeting place, creative space where anything goes and the world comes to find it. A global stage made in Scotland. An idea so nonsensical, no one could explain it copy, own, predict or contain it. A complex design with human heart, ever changing in state of the art. The fringe is groundbreaking, mischief making, shaping conversations but never taking itself too seriously. Its birth was an act of defiance and it will never be shushed. It begins and ends with Edinburgh. It's closes in taverns, venues and caverns and waiting in line for a show. That feeling of belonging in a crowd of perfect strangers. The fringe that calls Edinburgh home. to episode three of this year's fringe cast series uh, today we're talking about what venues are looking for and how to find one so without further ado should probably introduce you to who we have in the room so hi my name's alan and i'm the registration manager here at the fringe society daniel who are you hi i'm daniel which you could probably guess uh and i'm the digital marketing coordinator here at the fringe society we, you also have a colleague who to my left. is off camera and doesn't have a microphone that's leah <laughs> Leah, Leah's helping out technically today. Um, as you can see, she has lovely hands. Um, and we have joining us today um, our colleague Kevin. Do you want to introduce yourself, Kevin? Yes, hello everyone. I'm Kevin and I'm the Participant Projects Manager here at the Fringe Society. And I head up the team um, who's responsible or whose first um, you know, primary source of, uh, of, of need to be there is um, being the first point of contact for anyone who wants to bring a show to the Fringe or anyone who wants to run a Fringe venue. So I hope I bring something to the table today. Yeah, I would genuinely challenge anyone to have a question on venues that you didn't know the answer to or couldn't find oh the answer dear. to. Oh, <laughs> dear. Yeah, that's a challenge. If anyone has any questions, actually, that is a quite a smooth link. <laughs> Daniel, if anyone has questions, how does this session work today? So if you've never watched one of these before, we broadcast these live, as you could probably guess uh, at some point. We don't script these, uh, and anything can happen as we go along. And the reason we do that is we really want to hear from you guys. If you have any of those questions that Alan says Kevin will know the answer to, uh, just pop them just in. my get out deal free <laughs> card. I'm going to be like Kevin. <laughs> just uh, pop them in the live chat box uh, in the top right hand corner of YouTube or just look for the live chat button. If you're watching this YouTube video back, not live, uh, that chat won't work per se. We can't see your comments. We're not time travelers. But what is really handy is everything that's been said is sort of documented and shown as we go. So as you go along, you'll see the questions that came in and hopefully the answers that we give to them. Uh, in addition to being able to watch this live or watch the YouTube video back, you can also listen to all our FringeCast episodes as a podcast. If you just search for FringeCast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or just head to edfringe.com forward slash FringeCast, we've got all the details about how you can listen back. 
We also have some in-person sessions coming up as well. Yes, we do. If you happen to live in the London area, uh, the Edinburgh area, or New York, um, we have seven dates. We're on the road, and members of the team will be there to kind of meet you in person, present in person, and uh, answer any questions you may have. So please do check that out, because we would love to meet you and just say hello. Um, just to kind of reiterate what Daniel said, like the point of these French casts is for you. It's uh, there to support any artist that wants to come to the fringe. So really, we any, anything we can do with content to make Ooh. it better for you, um, please do let us know. Um, and with questions, like no question too big or too small, please just throw it in the chat because these are always the most fun when we get lovely engagement from people. And these episodes, although it's focused on a specific topic, in this case about how to find a venue, we're still going to co cover it in a very basic level. So if you want a little bit more detail about anything we cover or anything you've heard of or you're thinking about, do you ask us because then will, we'll try and allow for some time to go into that in a bit more detail or tell you where you can read up on it and find out a little bit more. Absolutely. So Daniel, run us through. What, what are we going to be talking about today? We've got uh, a lot to cover. Uh, as you can probably see. Uh, so we're trying to cover the next few, these few things in the next hour or so. So kicking off, uh, the question we ask in pretty much every episode, so why are you coming to the Fringe and what are your, the goals for your production and your show? Moving after that, we'll look at the scale of the Fringe and the range and diversity of venues that exist on the Fringe. And then within that, the different venue models that exist, and we'll cover the details of that. Once you've understood a bit of that, we'll start looking at your search, so the ways that we can assist you in searching for venues and some of the criteria you'll be looking at when trying to narrow down that list and making your decisions. Once you've built your long list, we'll talk through uh, a quick guide on how to contact those venues, the ways we can support you in that relationship, and then finally, once you've signed that contract and you're all ready to go, how you can work with your venue to help them help you. Great. Thank you very much, Daniel. So, episode three, up and running. We always start these by giving a sort of bit of information about who we are, because I think it's really important that we set those parameters out. So we work for the Fringe Society, which is the charity that underpins the Fringe. Um, it's not a case of us sort of running or managing the Fringe as such. We are the charity originally created by artists um, that runs the Fringe in, in a way that we're there to support artists, to advise them, um, but also we operate the box office, we're there to assist um, any audience members engage with the Fringe, um, and also market it sort of globally into the world. Um, and it's always really important that we establish this really early on, particularly if this is like the first episode you're listening to, because it's sometimes a, an area that people can misunderstand. And it's really important because it kind of um, roots your understanding in how you sort of engage with us and use us. Um, because it does mean that we're the Edin Festival Fringe is a non-curated festival. It's open access, which is a phrase we use quite a lot, which basically just means no one um, invites you to perform at the Fringe. There's no sort of rules. There's no governing body or programmer. It's very much a case of if you've got a story to tell, and ironically enough, considering today's topic, a venue that is willing to host you, um, then you can come. Um, and that's the, the, the joy of the Fringe. But it also can be a bit of a... Um, difficulty for people getting started because it means a lot of shows are self-producing or self-starting. So, Kevin, to cut to you, I kind of wondered, like, so in the context of finding a venue, how wh how does that sort of self-producing fact, like, I mean, the fact that we're not going to give someone a venue, I guess, is mm -hmm. what I'm hinting at. Right, so you're hinting at our impartiality. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, as just to follow on from what Alan was saying, um, the French society is entirely impartial. Um, so what that means is, in the same way that we don't promote any one particular show, we also don't promote or, um, or, or, or recommend any one particular venue. Um, so what we do do is provide you with fact-based advice um, and all of the tools um, to make the best decision in searching for a venue for yourself. So, um, and while that, I guess, sounds a little bit like we're just sort of putting the work onto you, we are in a way, but it also would be very much um, not in your best interest to just tell you which venue to go to because that may not be at all what you're looking for and only you know what you're looking for and what space will work best for you. Um, and it does go back to, and we'll probably talk about this again um, time and again, is the setting of your goals at the very beginning um, will also determine which venue you go with. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. That's actually a beautiful transition to the, the sort of next slide, I guess, the next sort of topic. And it it's something we've literally started both the previous episodes with and it's talking about your goals people are going to get tired of us talking about it but it it really is the crux of everything like so kevin how uh, some people may not see the connection between why your goals 
would make a difference to what venue you're in, but I think it does make a fundamental impact. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a bit about um, if you think about planning a planning a holiday away, and what 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 are you going to get out of this holiday? Is it is it um, you know a a bunch of books, so beach reads, sitting on the beach doing absolutely nothing, or are you exploring? the whole part of this country and seeing everything you possibly see about it? Um, or are you only going to see the the, um, the tennis that might be taking place in that country at the time or in that city? So um, it's about getting the most out of it. And obviously, if you just end up randomly going somewhere, that could be a wonderful holiday. But it doesn't make for the best fringe if you don't plan ahead. Yeah. So if, if you're coming, say, because you're looking for a bit of media exposure or you're going, actually, it's something to cross off your bucket list, that's probably going to affect your decisions that you're making. Definitely. Mm -hmm. definitely. Like taking that holiday analogy forward, it's like you can't say I want to go on holiday and have sort of sit by the beach and have the sun but go skiing at lunchtime. You have to kind of pick what you want to get out of it because if you try and achieve everything, you're not going to... Precisely. Unless you go... But there are places. I guess, I guess yes. Yes, yeah. there certainly are. And it's also any time, I think almost any time you engage with the French Society and ask us a question, no matter what part of the journey you're at, whether you're coming to us looking for advice on contacting the media later or maybe like trying to arrange a tour for After the Fringe, I think almost every single member of the team would start with what what are your goals, why mm -hmm. are you doing the Fringe, what are you getting out of it? Um, and it's a question you should have a really solid, clear answer to because it's going to drive everything else. Um, I guess talking about the Fringe in general, the next thing I wanted to talk about was kind of the scale. So a lot of the time we people hear about the number of shows so there being like over 4,000 shows around the fringe but there's still there's also a huge array of venues and then within mm -hmm. that they're kind of as diverse as the shows mm -hmm. themselves exactly yeah can you speak a bit about the range that we have <laughs> yeah definitely um so in the same way that any show can take part in the fringe um if they're able to find uh, a, a stage to perform on um anyone can be a venue if they um, register their details with us. So that means you can have a venue that is simply an empty garage, or you can have um, a huge producing venue that is a, in a traditional performing sort of theater-like space with a proscenium arch and a thrust stage and rate seating and all of that, and of course, everything in between. So it's important to think about what your show is and what, um, what surroundings that show will do well in. Yeah, and they really are spread pretty much all across mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. And it's worth saying that there's a sort of, there's more than a thousand different spaces in which shows take place. Yeah. Covering all, all mm -hmm. sort of ends of the spectrum, as Kevin said. Yeah. And that as Kevin says, that goes from like a venue that's like a year round operation as a theatre versus a venue that someone sets up uh, I mean this year we had a venue that was in the audience's own home. Yes, yeah, that was quite unique, <laughs> yeah. actually, but but not not unique as in it's never been done before. Yeah. Um, but there have been venues that are in taxi cabs, um, in an airplane once, on a ferry, um, at the airport. All sorts of places have been venues. So um, obviously those are very site-specific and, and unique to the shows that we're looking for that kind of space. But um, do keep in mind that it's not necessarily just the kind of venue. Um, you also want to think about location as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess before we get stuck into that, it's worth giving a quick shout out to some previous episodes in the series. Uh, so episode one, this is episode three. So episode one tries to tackle that question. Should you do a show at the Fringe? Is 2020 the right year for you? And it's a good question to ask in the sense of, is this the year where you're bringing a production entirely by yourself? Because in the case of some genre, you may want to be part of shows that already exist, such as a showcase or mm -hmm. similar. So if you haven't yet already, do make sure to check out that episode. And then in the last episode, episode two, we talked about the basics of how we go about bringing a show to the Fringe. Rather than jumping straight in at trying to find a venue and, and long listing, yeah. try and ask, answer those questions first, because it really helps inform the decisions you then make about your venue. Totally. And as we talked a lot about in the previous two episodes, research is a really important aspect to bringing the show to the Fringe. You can tell when you speak to people in August, you can tell the people who've done the groundwork, mm -hmm. the people who know their stuff rather than, and that's not to say that other people have, have a complete disaster, but you see that um, really quick learning <laughs> curve that people have to go on um, in August when suddenly everything's happening all at once. Um, that research pays back. And I mean, listening to this is research and there's always, there's no bad time. There's no bad time. The process. There's no bad time to listen to this, but if you're listening to this in 2019, you're mm -hmm. already, you know, ahead, almost ahead of the game, you're definitely doing the right thing by researching and getting that yeah. sense of the picture. Absolutely. And I think, um, and this is a little time sensitive. This is, well, it's not really. Um, the, what I was going to suggest is looking at last year's programme. Uh, and the reason I say it's a little time sensitive is if you do this um, sort of pre-January, when the new batch of shows go on sale, 
you can actually use um, edfringe.com really well rather than going through the actual physical program. You can really search by genre, um, by venue to really find the shows that are similar to yours. It's, th it's that idea of like, nothing's like fully original. <laughs> Finding the people who've done what you've done before or something similar is a really important stage in the process. Kevin, I know like um, with your team, referring back to last year's program is always mm -hmm. like a good it's, tip. It's, <laughs> a, it's a brilliant um, uh, start on your research in, in looking for a venue. Um, not only just for the, the kinds of shows that are similar to yours and what sort of spaces did they perform in, but also um, lots of people have opinions and it's really good to do some extra research and contact those shows that happened in those venues and ask them all sorts of questions that are the burning questions in your mind about um, performing at the Fringe and how did they find it. Um, so they can not only just give you top tips, but also give you advice on the venue that they were in as well. So it's really useful to do that. And of course, um, most most performing companies will have some sort of social media presence in which you, you know, by which you can get in touch mm. with them. That links really well to the goals aspect of it. Because mm -hmm. you may look at, if you, say if you came to the Fringe last year, you have a sense of how well shows did. Uh, talking to them about what their goals were, because from the outside it made it like they had a fantastic fringe, but actually their objective was to achieve something like achieve X, but they achieve Y. Mm -hmm. So it's always worth understanding why they were coming to the fringe and seeing if that is the same as yours. And if so, there's a lot you can learn from them. Also, fringe performers love sort of paying it back. Mm -hmm. Like people, like I've never met a fringe performer that doesn't want to talk about the expo experience of doing it. Um, I normally get made fun of in this podcast for how much I talk about when I did a show. Um, <laughs> you did a show so, at the French? Yeah, first oh. reference this episode. <laughs> um, we'll do a whole spin-off episode about it, the backstory. <laughs> yeah, but the, and yeah, the generally just talking to people and sort of finding finding out sort of how what their experience was. What like. I did want to add is Alan did say that the, the show listing on the website is time sensitive and we will be taking the 2019 shows <coughs> off the site in January 2020. But the 2019 program and its kind of written document form is available as an online publication uh, yeah. and as a PDF, um, which is always a great reference tool. And if you want to go further back, get in touch because we can definitely, if you're looking at a specific year, for example, we can give you the historical fringe program to give you a sense of where your show fits as part of the, the festival as a whole. Absolutely. So drilling down a little bit, getting to the nitty gritty, the facts, um, I guess one of the key sort of uh, ways to categorise venues, if we can call it that, one of the, the first key ways of differentiating between them is that there are different models that work and mm -hmm. that will affect a lot of things like um, how much they'd cost to hire and that kind of thing. Um, so Kim, do you want to talk through the... Um, different venue models that mm -hmm. we have on the fringe. Yep, definitely. Um, before we go into that, I'd also point out um, that, uh, or, or I guess reiterate that venues um, are very much independent of the Fringe Society and they're also very much independent of each other. So when we're talking about venue models as, a, as an average, as an approximation, that doesn't mean that that's the only way that, that they exist on the Fringe. They exist in so many different ways and the only way that you'll really fully learn about it is by contacting them. So we'll get into the contacting them bit later. But yes, to cover off the, the sort of the major uh, venue models on the fringe, um, one of them obviously is a straight hire, which pretty much um, is, is self-explanatory in that you pay them a certain amount of money for the use of the space for a certain amount of time, and and that's it. Um, so there's there's very little um, worry about about ticket sales, about about um, knowing how much money you're going to make in the end, because or, or sorry, spend in the end, because you've certainly got that covered off. So that is an option very much for first timers. Um, it it ha helps them a lot just in their budgeting, so that they're aware of what their outlay is right at the start. And I guess that aspect of one you've done at the start, but also at the fringe, there's not the same pressure sometimes on tickets, mm -hmm. money coming back in. You kind mm -hmm. of are like, my outgoings are done yep. and there's less pressure on how many. So more, more, pre more, predi <laughs> more predictable as it were. Yeah, mm -hmm. outgoings, so. yep, yep, definitely. Um, so the other, the other model is a box office split. Um, and traditionally on the fringe, that's a 40, 60 split, which 40% um, going to the venue and 60% going to the company. That is all entirely dependent on what um, agreement you come to with the venue, though. So that can change. It can be 35 for the venue and 65 for the show. Um, it all depends on what you need out of it, out of the venue, and how much that's going to then cost them. Um, so that 
that's another option for many people because they can then on a daily basis sort of know where they're at financially. Um, the other um, one is a box office split with a guarantee. So that's where the venue, um, so you've ha you'll have your traditional box office split, but the venue will put a guarantee in place that say, um, you know, y your, your end of the ticket sales needs to hit thousand pounds X amount of money ahead of time before the box office split kicks in sometimes as well. So that's um, that's a bit of a, it's a difficult one um, because you do really have to be on top of your ticket sales. You have to be monitoring that all the time. You have to have a really dynamic budget in place that allows you to put in everything and figure out exactly where you are sometimes to tell you how many more tickets you mm -hmm. need to sell. But um, the great advantage about this, um, this particular model is that the venue is fully invested in making mm -hmm. sure that um, bums are in seats, that they're helping you market the show to as many and as wide an audience as possible. So their, their interest in making sure that your house is full is as much on, on their laps as it is in yours. So that's, um, that's quite a popular one on the fringe. I think that's also a really good point you made in that the, your, the level of investment a venue needs in a specific show, because not necessarily in a negative way, but some venues, they, they accept, they, they're on a straight hire, they, they don't program as such, they are open access mm -hmm. in the same way that we are, but that might mean they have less of a stake, sounds a bit harsh, but they, they might not have the same sort of media and marketing team behind them to suddenly be like also pushing your show. That mm -hmm. very much sits with the show themselves. Yep, um, it's 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 not to say that the, that the straight hires don't do that because straight hires do an awful lot of marketing. Some do and some don't, yeah. but again, it's about having that conversation with them to, to find out what it is that they'll do for your show. Um, but also with the, but it's certainly guaranteed when you've got that box yeah. office split with a guarantee situation um, in place, you know that everyone's on board fully with trying to sell the show. And sometimes, you know, if one show's doing um, not as well as another, there might be a larger focus on yours. If yours happens <laughs> to be the one that isn't um, selling as well. So um, have that conversation ahead of time um, and, and come to an idea on what sort of split and guarantee you want in place. Um, if I may, though, I might go on to the other models, yep. um, which um, are called the, the, the free model or the free model organization. And this is um, sometimes uh, quite confused in terms of what people are talking about when they say the term free. Um, so for, for punters, that means, or, or even to, to those looking for a venue, sometimes that, that free model might mean that um, audience members don't pay for tickets or it's a, 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 ticket, it's a free ticketed, um, a free non-ticketed event um, or show, but that's not necessarily always the case. And also, um, it doesn't mean that necessarily the venue is absolutely free. There's always going to be some sort of cost incurred when you're bringing a show to the fringe. Um, and in some cases, that can be uh, a situation where you're buying kit and sharing it amongst the shows that um, are you, that you're sharing the space with. Um, so there's always going to be some sort of charge. Um, so have that in mind. But there are sort of um, two main free model organizations that operate on the fringe. And one of them is PBH's Free Fringe. And the other is Laughing Horse Free Festival. Um, they both have their own ways and means of operating. They have their own ethos and conditions and terms and conditions of registering with them. So I would go to their websites and have a look at their stuff. But um, in terms of um, when we're going to talk about searching for venues and contacting them, we also have their contact details. But I'd encourage you to go to the individual websites of each of the venues that you're interested in, in looking at to see what they have on their websites individually. It's all about that research. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then um, a new-ish one that has um, sort of come to the fore in, in recent years that many different venues, um, d regardless of their model, are, are kind of using, which is a pay-what-you-want system. And um, what that means is not that you pay what you want for your venue, um, but what it means, it's, it's a ticketing um, term. So it essentially, audience members um, pay a set amount to guarantee them a seat. Um, or they can turn up and hope that they can get into your show and perhaps leave something in a hat or a bucket as they leave, depending on what they, they think of the show. So that's, a, that's another model, and um, the, the main operator of that on the fringe is um, uh, Heroes of the Fringe, and also Just the Tonic recently have been doing that a lot as well, so I'd encourage you to, to have a look at their um, websites directly. I'm so glad you talked about pay what you want. Every time I do it, I find it very hard to describe. Oh, it's, it's written down. <laughs> yeah. so I, I, I it's one of those ones I always start off very well meaning and get more and more complicated. Um, so we've sort of established the different models, the different types. How can people, how can we start helping people in their search? What tools can we provide? 
Yep. Um, so we have um, a number of tools. We've got um, an online venue search tool, which is essentially um, just, uh, just an online platform where you can put in information, you can tick certain boxes of what you're looking for. Um, but uh, otherwise, we also have a downloadable PDF with all of the um, spaces uh, very uh, detailed in, in, in that PDF, which is a lot of work. So lots of people use, the, so use them to sort of cross-reference e each other, I guess, those, those two um, search patterns. What we're actually working on at the moment is a new search, which I hope will be ready, and I'm saying this um, for the first time, but hopefully we'll be ready quite soon. So um, we will have one resource that will um, be a little bit more dynamic and allow you to narrow down your, your, your search a little bit um, finer. But um, es essentially there are three sort of main criteria that you want to look at when you're searching for a venue. And that um, the first one really is audience capacity. Um, when you're thinking about how many people you're going to perform to, how many performances you're going to have in your run. So if that's 22, is that in, going to happen in a 40-seater or is that going to happen in a 100-seater? And obviously that those numbers, once you multiply them by 22, really yeah. start to add up. Um, so having that in mind, think about um, what, what size um, audience or what size room you're going to perform in. Um, the other one is um, the programming of the venue. So in our um, search tool and also in the PDF, we list all of the programming preferences of the venues. Some of them um, have, a, have a very straight, unique focus. Um, some of them focus on international work. Some of them only do acoustic music. Um, so it's very important to obviously look at those because the space could be right, but if that is not really the focus of the venue and that's not what it's known for and that's not the audience following of that venue, then that might not necessarily be the best place for your show. So do a little bit of research into that as well. Um, and then the, the third criteria is location, really looking at um, where it might be. And this goes back to also when you're talking about your goals and all of that. Obviously, we want bums and seats. We want audience. It's, it's great for, for, um, for your company's morale. It's great for you to see a full house each night. But um, equally, uh, looking at location, not just in terms of getting as many people into your show because this particular venue is in an area of high traffic where lots of other um, people will just drop in and see your show. That might not necessarily always be the case. So is your show a destination kind of show? Is it is it the kind of show that someone will look at the program or look online, say, in January and say, I'm buying a ticket for that. That's the yeah. show I'm seeing. <laughs> it doesn't matter where it's playing. Um, and also looking at um, when I was talking about what um, programming preferences are for the venue, for instance, you know, there's a there's a venue that um, hosts acoustic music. It's been operating on the fringe for more than 20 years. Um, it's brilliant at what it does. Uh, they have a great audience following, and a lot of shows go there, um, specifically because it has an audience following. So thinking about your goals and bringing it back to that is sort of why this is a bit of a circular conversation. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Um, location is not necessarily always, oh, I want to be right next to where everything is happening. While that can be good for mm -hmm. many shows, it's not necessarily good for every show. So yeah. have a think about that too. I also think it's like, I uh, can't reiterate enough how to be really realistic when you're looking at your crit particularly like something like capacity. Mm -hmm. So if you're used to selling out a hundred seats in your hometown um, over a week long run, <laughs> coming to a, a festival where there's thousands of other shows happening along the month mm. and you're doing a full month instead of the week and you don't have that sort of home base that you can be like, right guys, come on out and get your tickets. Um, to be really realistic about that size, yep. I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, it's unbelievable what you're up against, so always keep that in mind. And you speak, you speak from experience in that regard that when you've brought shows, the smaller space is often better because a smaller, fuller audience that gets your show is yeah. much better than a bigger audience that isn't quite right for you or is um, full. I'll be honest, I did exactly what... Um, I feel like a very good pupil. I did exactly what Kevin was talking about. I um, used the PDF um, guide a lot, and actually I... Um, it's not very great for the planet because I did a lot of printing, but I just needed it to be physically in front of me. Um, and I did... I used exactly that criteria to try and drill down. So actually, capacity was one of my big definers. I kind of... I was aiming for around a 50-seater. I just felt that's what I felt comfortable with. Um, so actually, that sort of brought it down already. I, I knew I wanted like a kind of street higher model, so that kind of limited it again. And I got down to like six or seven. Um, and then that's when I sort of spread them all out on the floor and started really looking at like stage dimensions and things. 
Um, so generally, those criteria, I can speak from experience, take what can be quite an overwhelming number mm -hmm. of venues. It's actually surprising how quickly it can come down to a much more manageable chunk. Mm -hmm. And that being said, as well, if you if you're you know if you return results that are you know there's only three, I would encourage you to contact at least seven to ten. And I know this is going into our next step. <laughs> Sorry, I keep doing that. No, no, it's good. Um, it's fluid. But um, I, I would encourage you to contact as many venues as you possibly can. So widening your search criteria, um, you know, not necessarily being. Um, completely wedded to only 50 as yeah, a capacity, absolutely. making that, you know, maybe a sliding scale of um, 20 plus or, or minus would be helpful. Before we jump into contacting a venue, there were just two things I wanted to throw into the mix. Oh. So if you're looking for that fringe venue search tool, if you just search fringe venue search tool, you'll either find the existing one or by the time you're listening to this, hopefully our new shiny uh, search tool will be up and running. And the second one, just because it's my obsession, uh, when talking about location, if you're not familiar with the city of Edinburgh, really looking at it on a map and getting a sense of scale. Because if you're coming from a larger city, we've had many people listening today coming from LA or New York or, or London, and you look at the map of Edinburgh and you worry that a location, uh, particularly when it comes to may maybe your, uh, your accommodation or your venue, it's, it may look like it's miles out of town, but actually if you just do a, a journey search, you realize, oh, that's a 10-minute that's a walk away. So it's always worth just getting a sense of scale about the city uh, to not be so overwhelmed by it. That's also, I mean, I know it's a bit of a luxury and maybe not available to everyone, but being able to come to the fringe as a punter or do as, on a bit of a research trip is just excellent. In terms a major of idea. advantage over someone who, who can't do that. Mm, totally. Absolutely. Being able to go around, because there are, as much as there's a widespread, there, there's undeniably like little hubs around town. Um, and sometimes, as Kevin was saying, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to be right in the middle of that hub if your show is not... Mm -hmm what that like there's there's no point being in the middle of like a, a thriving stand-up scene if you've got like a beautiful physical theater show because that's probably not where you're most advantageous mm -hmm. <laughs> i've also got a couple of questions oh. from people listening in uh Exciting. before no we pressure. go on to the the practical steps of contacting venues uh i thought I'll pick, I'll pick um trudy's question to start um so very briefly is there a way we can easily sum up the pros and cons of a free model versus a paid model especially for a first time fringe performer um so not, the, not that I could do that, because I don't know your specific situation, Trudy, but what I would say is, um, if, it, if, it, if I'm assuming it's coming down to finances, mm -hmm. um, I think, you first of all, if you've not done a budget, you should start doing that. We do have a budget tool on our website, mm -hmm. which does all the maths for you, um, and it's, a, it's just a, an Excel spreadsheet which you can download and pop all sorts of numbers in to see where you're at in terms of your um, income and expenditure. But um, I, I wouldn't say that there are pros and cons, but I mean, there are pros and cons, but it depends on your unique situation. Um, I think there's there's a misconception on the fringe that um, that free venues or free model venues, uh, the shows happening in free model venues are lesser somehow, mm -hmm. and that is absolutely not the case. Um, I've seen I've seen many many shows start off in the in uh, in and around the free model fringe um, and then move into a paid venue. I've seen shows start in a paid venue and move back to a free model or, or, or turn to a free model in their following years. Um, the fringe is very much not a, a one-shot go. Um, if you're looking to be successful on the fringe, that's a three to five year journey of being like the most famous person or one of the most famous people on the fringe. And I think the most, um, if, if your work is ready and you're ready to come to the fringe, I think the most viable option or the most viable way in for you that you can identify for yourself that is financially stable, that won't ruin you, um, and will be able to help your show be the best it can be on the fringe is the choice that you should make. So while that's a bit of a, an answer that kind of sits mm -hmm. on the fence, I think... I think it's not for us to say that there are pros and cons for either yeah. because it's unique to your and situation. Just, just before you come in, Alan, they've sort of followed. Uh, we have actually two people with a very similar situation. They want to say the pros and cons of each. Uh, and in their case, in both those cases, they're kind of doing a solo show, sort of improvised-based musical. So your, your point is it's not necessarily about the show itself, but more about their plan, their goals, and their, mm -hmm. what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, I'd say that leads on to what I was going to say, actually, because I think where we can really come into our own with advising is actually once you've made that decision... Because, like, I kind of agree with Kevin, and there's no like sort of set pros and cons, but there'll be different ways of working. So, like, maybe like in your approach when you're contacting the press, obviously there might not be like tickets available if it's on ticketing. So there just might be different ways of like pitching your show or establishing your show or like flying. So like those kind of decisions 
will change. But it's like once you've made that decision and you're comfortable with it and you're happy that it's the right mm -hmm. one for you and your show, that's when you can then come to us and be like, okay, how does that... I'm used to having tickets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how is how is that going to change? And that's something where we can sort of help and advise down the line now. So. And uh, it, just to touch yeah. on that as well, um, it's, it's something I mentioned earlier, but I'm contacting them. Uh, is is a good way to find out what the pros and cons of each are. So that's why we encourage you to not just narrow narrowly, you know, sit, go for a venue that mm -hmm. Kevin might suggest, that that Alan might suggest. That's not the way to go about it. You you really need to be doing your research and contacting those venues and finding out what they can do to help you. So you contact a few free models, you contact a few paid models, um, and see what they're going to offer you, and then weigh them up that way. And that's where you get your pros and cons from. Um, we've got another question, and we touched upon this a lot in episode two, I believe. Uh, we got slightly obsessed about pianos, and it was all rooted in the in the sense that... We always that use the example of, of do piano. they have a grand piano? So never, usage. when you're starting that venue search or that venue relationship, is never assuming, or never assuming anything about the fringe, don't assume that they have this tech, or indeed they have a, uh, a piano. So Cynthia got in touch and said, my show needs a piano. Are there any locations that have one? Mm -hmm. So how would you go about that? So, um, well, I mean... the without um, without uh, talking up the new search um, too much, <laughs> and I, I probably shouldn't, so I won't, but um, if you get in touch with us directly, um, and that's uh, participants at edfringe.com, it's a great email to have. That's where me and my team sit at the end of that, so we're pretty, pretty able to answer any question that you might have, and we do also have a list of venues that have a piano in situ, or have told us that they have a piano in situ, um, so we can pass that along to you if that's an absolute must, but also, um, making sure that you don't discount other venues that might be able to get one in for you, might have have one um, that, that's nearby or in another part of the building. There's all sorts of scenarios um, where, where venues will be able to help you with that. So don't, don't put that aside as, as all the venues that don't have a piano in situ aren't for me. I think talking to them again um, and, and contacting them is, is the best. Yeah, this kind of segues Sorry, I know. So I've got some of our hold off for now. I think contacting is. Yeah, I, I was just going to say. Into. So kind of <clears throat> on contacting. Um, so obviously there's different ways, and as Kevin suggested, there there's lots of different um, tools on our site where you can find those contact details. But I would say the one thing that I learned and that I really want to stress here is that up upfrontness and honesty is really important in this process, um, and that seems like a really obvious thing to say, but. I, I don't think you can overstretch it. Like you, It's not like I'm going to make myself sound as great as possible so as this venue wants me. or um, I want to be in that venue, so I'm going to not ask these things that I'm unsure about because I don't want to look silly or anything. I, I can 100% say any time I've had a really great relationship with a venue, it's because right at the start there was a complete sort of transparency of what you were looking for. Mm -hmm. I think you, you picked on, uh, there's a perfect phrase there, which is the relationship with your venue. Um, this is a relationship that will last you your fringe, and it can be really influential. So if you have a good relationship during the fringe with your venue, that's great. And if they have a good one with you, that's that's great as well. Um, so definitely not um, thinking that uh, that you, you should hold back on anything. Um, be as upfront, as yeah. Alan said, as possible with, with everything that you're, with all, with all of your questions and all of your research. Um, are we jumping into contacting? Yeah, I'm, I'm I think well. straight on into. Um, I think we're in contacting and relationship building we and are. how we can help we all in a one. <laughs> um, so essentially, the the venue search that we have and the PDF do contain the contact details of those venues. Um, as I said, they're all different. So some of them will like a phone call. Some of them would like an email. Some of them have an online application form that you fill out. Um, where you put in the details of your show, but um, it's all they all have varying ways of means of, of wanting to be contacted. So I would research that uh, with our guides to see which way would be the best way to contact them. Um, also, uh, going back to the, the 7 to 10, that's just an average rule. If you find 12 or 15, contact all of them. Um, definitely make that contact. It's the conversation. It's being open and honest about what you need out of them. And um, Alan touched on it earlier as well, where he's saying you, you might want to hold back because you want to you want to be seen in a good light by a venue. So yes, it can feel a bit like you are um, auditioning in, in some odd way for a venue, or your show is auditioning itself for a venue. But um, really what you should be doing, and while, yes, you can make yourself look as wonderful as you like, but... It, 
the, the crux of it is you need to find out what that venue can do for your show and how it's going to help you. Um, be that with marketing, be that with audience, be that with engaging with, um, with, uh, with the media or engaging with the arts industry mm. if they have that, that sort of offer there. Um, so there's all sorts of things that a venue can do to help you with the goals that you already identified or you should have identified yeah. much <laughs> earlier. Um, so it's, it's about thinking how the venue can help you as well as also obviously impressing them with your, with your show. Yeah. And don't be afraid to ask questions because mm-hmm. I mean I, am, I can't think of any venue manager who would rather you ask that question in the first week of August mm-hmm. than when you're sort of finalizing mm-hmm. that relationship and getting that contract in place mm-hmm. like it something you think might be a stupid question might actually give you an answer that you didn't suspect like you might be like oh no we mm-hmm. don't have any dressing room space um or, or something like that and you once you know that information you can then plan for it and the venues want also, another thing: the venues talk to one another. Um, please don't play them off against one each, each other. <laughs> um, we always sort of say something about the fringe is uh, massive in many ways, but it's also quite a small community in many ways, and you 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 don't want to be like playing people off against mm-hmm. one another or that kind of thing. I think it's a very straightforward, honest. We we also say that all the all the work and effort you put in now is what it, it can multiply a hundred times if if you do it now rather than in August. So if you're answering those questions. Um, it buys you more time when you get nearer August to be focusing on your show because ultimately that is the most important thing you're bringing to Edinburgh. And if you're suddenly worrying, again, is there a piano or is this venue right for me? Mm-hmm. You're not able to focus on your show. So it's about asking those questions early uh, and not being afraid to have those sort of difficult conversations early because often things you maybe assu- you su- assume may not be the case and things may be actually a lot easier than you think. Kevin, one thing I want to ask you because it's a question whenever we're sort of out and about, I get asked an awful lot. And it's people worrying about when they've done the right thing, they've contacted lots of people, but then they've maybe not heard back from choice number one. Mm -hmm. But then they're worried about leaving number two Mm -hmm. hanging kind of thing. How would you approach that kind of situation when you're waiting to hear from someone? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's about following up. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, obviously, there's there's certain crunch times when venues are inundated with, with requests um, just just for information. Never mind um, signing contracts or coming to agreements. So, bearing that in mind, um, one thing in terms of a timeline to keep in mind as well is that most venues will prefer to program their full runs first. Um, so, if you are planning on coming for a full run, you're more likely to hear from a venue sooner. And if you are coming for three to five performances or, or two weeks, um, you're more likely to hear from a venue a little bit later that perhaps than, than what you would imagine or what you would want. Um, and that's simply because if you can think of a blank slate, um, there's the schedule for the month. It's easier for a venue to slot in all the large, um, large, um, the, the longer runs mm-hmm. first, um, and then fit in the smaller runs around those longer runs or, or the one-offs even. So. Um, just keep that in mind in terms of the, the time it takes for them to re- get back to you. Um, but also uh, following up with them. So if it's been, you know, if it's been two weeks, I think it's perfectly fine to say, hi, you know, um, I'm, I'm here again and <laughs> I'm still interested. Um, and also being o- uh, upfront and honest about having received um, um, an offer from yeah. another venue is totally fine as well. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think if you're if you're doing that, you're just, you're just being completely open and honest. Yeah. And that obviously sets the great and wonderful tone that you want to have going with you throughout the fringe um, in that relationship if that comes to fruition in the end. If, yeah. I, if I may, there's a, there's a question that links hopefully really well to that uh, step and it's from Kate uh, and she was asking, uh, can venues drop performers at any time? So when, when are you considered booked with a venue? Um, when, you, when you sign a contract. Um, so you can you can have some sort of agreement that goes back and forth in an email, um, but once you've exchanged contracts and signed them, um, that's pretty much you locked in. There may be varying rules around that depending on the conversation that you're having with a venue, because obviously these things can they, they don't happen um, robotically. Um, there there are all sorts of different reasons why um, you might have one holding, or or a venue might say, in, in a perfect situation that um, you know Alan described, where you you've not heard back from one but you've had an offer from another. Um, in that situation, that, that other venue might say, okay, well, you know what, I'm willing to wait. That's okay. You let me know when you hear back. And at that point, it is a bit of a gray area, but I think it's important to have that conversation with the venue first. So if you, are, if you do find yourself in a situation like that, that you are entirely sure that if, if an offer is made to you, you ask, is this offer meant that 
does this mean that mm -hmm. I'm booked or does this mean that this is mm -hmm. an offer that's that's standing and you get that clarified right away yeah is it fair to say although we're not we're not legal advisors if you are dealing in that contract phase of things that again we're here to assist if there's anything you're not sure about mm -hmm. we can offer impartial advice on whether something sounds right yeah um and help with that definitely uh, each each situation is unique yeah. so yeah. it's impossible to say so do, just get in touch with us directly that's but you do have the advantage mm -hmm. of having dealt with thousands of <laughs> artists over, uh, over the previous ranges so we do have some some sense of how things should be working yeah i'd also say um Kevin made a really good point. That contract is a really important point in that there's a reason that um, the, one of the only um, parameters for being able to register your show with the Fringe Society is we ask that you have your contract first for the very reason that we just need you to have confirmed with your venue mm -hmm. before you can then register your show with the Fringe Society. I'm trying to um, see if there's any good questions I could recap upon. So some of the questions came in was sort of rather specific about what venues suit this kind of show. Um, and we're impartial, so there's no finite answer. But I think, as Kevin said, if you have a specific case of, I'm doing this, what should I do? Mm -hmm. There are the venue search tools, but just emailing us at participants at edfringe.com to tell us your story and what you're, what you're doing is really helpful. We also had uh, a few questions coming in about um, when uh, a venue sort of theoretically says yes, like we're, this is what we want to offer you. How quickly are you expected uh, to come back with a sort of find a confirmed yes or no on your side? Um, generally, uh, in an offer, a venue will say, uh, will, will tell you when they would like to hear back from, from, from you. Um, so that, that's one indication that will hopefully be there in the offer. Um, but if not, it's also important to keep in mind that an offer is not the end of it. Um, so if there are parts of that offer that you're perhaps not really comfortable with or, or feel you need clarity on or, or would like to expand in one way or don't need a certain part mm -hmm. of that offer but would prefer to have something else that they might be able to offer you that isn't included in that. Um, there's a negotiation stage there as well. So the the the, the offer of an offer, yeah. um, for lack of a better phrase that didn't come to my mind, um, someone giving you an offer is not the end of the road in terms of, of that conversation. You still can pick up that conversation and and it negotiate for something that, that you want that is closer to what you're looking for. Um, so the, the real answer is, I, I think you, you should establish that with them. So if someone has given you an offer and you like the offer, but you're still thinking about it, I think going back to them and saying, this is great, I need X amount of time to think about it, is that okay? And then they will get back to you and let you know. So there's no standard way of operating in that way. Each situation is unique. So um, if it isn't stated, um, specifically in the offer when they would like to hear back, then I would clarify that with them for when you're comfortable about accepting that offer. Yeah, when you said an offer of an offer, that kind of um, was triggering in a positive way for me um, of, because an offer doesn't necessarily just mean it's in black. Like sometimes an offer means that you've then got a decision to make as well because, um, so for example, my first year, my offer was we have these slots in these spaces at these times at these prices mm -hmm. so it was then then a, it was kind of like a game of ping pong and the sort of the balls back in my court to then go okay i really like that time but that's in a bigger capacity than i wanted so then it becomes looking at your goals which you've established and going right what where am i willing to make compromises mm -hmm. where am i not willing to make compromises um yeah so it's that idea of an offer doesn't necessarily mean it's like a there you go, there's exactly what you want and you accept it. It's exactly. very much more complicated than that. <laughs> it's also, it's, 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 it's unintentionally a philosophical point, but when oh we, were, we were, we were we contacted and spoke to a lot of artists uh, in Fringe 2019 to record some of their views about bringing the show to the Fringe. And one of the most overwhelming things we heard back from them is the importance of being kind and civil. Uh, Alan's point about the fringe being both huge but also like a family. So if in these initial conversations you're being really friendly, upfront, mm -hmm. enthusiastic, and civil, the difference that makes in terms of people looking out for you and helping you is just you can't yeah. value it, it enough. It goes back to what Kevin was saying: is this is probably one of the most real important relationships you're going to establish mm -hmm. in bringing your show to the fringe, and getting that off on the right foot is really important because we talk about all the time like we can help and advise and support but in an impartial way you're some some um venues they can they can really get behind a certain work they don't have that um impartiality in the same way mm -hmm. that we do um and sometimes um if a venue if an opportunity comes up like um i can't think of an example but 
would be realistic, so I'm not going to say one. Um, but if something comes up and they're like, oh, I've got that company in mind, because actually mm-hmm. they've emailed back any time where I've sent um, asked for anything, or that kind of thing. It's just the, if you're someone that's nice to work with, then... And especially, I mean, we as an organisation, as a charity, we're incredibly small, there's only 30 of us working at the Fringe Society, and the same applies to most venues. They're often small operations. Many of them are volunteer-run, so the nicer you are to people, the more you're going to get back from them. Just uh, be nice. We had uh, another question from Trudy who was asking, are there any resources for matching you up with, uh, for example, a local pianist or musician for your show in case your musical director cannot commit to the full run of your show? Um, there isn't a resource, but um, that's because, well, we, for years we had um, on our website, and this is going back to before my time, which sounds very strange, um, but uh, we did have a forum on our website, um, but the rise of social media really made that redundant. Mm. Um, so I would say if you if you are a tweeter or if you um, use Twitter, mm. I'm, I'm really, really exposing myself <laughs> here with my <laughs> lack of Twitter use, um, but using the hashtag Ed Fringe and asking that question um, really is really mm-hmm. helpful. Also, um, looking at the various Facebook pages that are dedicated <laughs> yeah. to the Fringe, um, those open up all sorts of amazing conversations where you see people helping each other. So while we could host something like that, um, it, it's sort of self-managing at this point because of the the rise. Of the rise the, 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 yeah. the, the, uh, Facebook, Facebook's a key one, and it's one that... So there, there are a number of groups that just happen over, whether they're fringe-related or indeed Edinburgh or Scotland music-related. But we also have an official artist group that we set up often in it will be early 2020, where it's just an opportunity for people who are definitely bringing a show to the fringe just to ask questions are often from people who've been here before who may have a contact may know someone and indeed if you're not just looking at people who live in edinburgh the number of musicians and pianists you're not going to it's probably the best city in the world to be in if you wanted to find one yeah. would be edinburgh in august so you yeah. will find one it's just about making those right connections i would also say it might be a little off topic of venues but i know um, earlier on you said a lot of the people commenting where uh, i can't believe i just did the action for typing mm. uh, for anyone watching along um for anyone commenting um that they're doing solo shows. Mm-hmm. And I would say, um, if you're a solo show, those Facebook groups and making those connections earlier have twofold, if not more, of an effect. Because one, they can practically help you with questions and decision making, but also it kind of, sounds a little cheesy, but it, it, it can kind of help you find your tribe quite early. Mm-hmm. Like find a community of people that can massively help you when you're in Edinburgh. Because I think there's no denying, when you're on your own, it can be a tougher thing if you're managing multiple different aspects of putting on a show definitely yeah great we've, we've covered a lot of the content daniel if you've got questions still coming. I, I i hope we've covered the questions we received uh today uh about the topic of how to find a venue for your fringe show but you know, if you're if you're catching up with us later on youtube in the podcast version if you have a specific question about fringe casts then you can email fringecast at fringe.com but your main go-to email address with any questions yeah. about how to bring a show to the fringe is participants at edfringe.com. It'll go to Kevin and the team who will do their very best to answer your questions or point you in the right direction of where you can find the answer. Particularly, like this feels now like it's now becoming a hype job for you and your team, Kevin. But it's it's <laughs> it's true. Like that, if you leave listening to this with one thing, like that participants at edfringe.com email address is really important. And it's the it's the reason why, like if if any questions come in that are really specific, um that we, de- we tend to just um, maybe not address them in this kind of forum because it's not the best place for them and actually pass them on to the team themselves because it's a mu- like the, an- the answer would become so mm-hmm. specific that every, actually... Every show situation is unique um, and they're all looking for different things. So that's where, um, as Daniel started with the, the, the this session with, um, we're touching the very, very highlights of, of, uh, of the many aspects of not just bringing a show to the fringe, but also selecting a venue. So if you have any more really specific questions, get in touch with us that way. But also I should point out, we also are happy to do, um, you know, a, a, like a 20 minute Skype chat, if that's something you want to do, or or even just give you a ring over the phone, um, if, if that's an easier way for you to um, absorb information, because there is a lot of information to take <laughs> in. Um, so we're happy to do that as well. Yeah, excellent sounding boards. Sometimes. You know what you want, but you actually just need to talk it over with someone to exactly. reveal that you know what you want. Um, putting slightly on the spot, Kevin, so I apologise in advance. Um, if we're to round up, if we're sort of going with one sort of message about someone who's like, I need to start looking for a fringe venue, mm-hmm. what, what would be your one 
sort of overarching bit of advice that you give? Um, one is um, start doing your research now. Um, this is the perfect time to do it. Um, venues have, um, for the most part, um, are not, uh, they're not dormant, but they're certainly um, uh, sort of finalizing um, the last fringe and, and starting to move into it next year. So now is a perfect time to start doing your research and start contacting them. Um, but above all, um, the, the knowing your goals and knowing why you're bringing your show to the fringe, knowing specifically what your show needs from a venue, and that could be, you know, uh, as is important as a sprung floor, though hopefully you would know that already and have that well established. But if there's any little things that you specifically need, having those at the forefront, um, and then contacting as many venues as possible. And that's not just as many venues within a certain um, venue operating model, but as many venues as you can find that are so contacting a free model, contacting a straight hire, contacting a, a box office split with a guarantee, and so on and so forth. Um, really diversifying your, your research so that when you do make a decision, it's the best decision that you can ba make based on all the information that you could possibly have to make that decision on, rather than just pigeonholing or siloing your, your research into one area. Yeah, uh, research would be, ma I'm asking myself the question now, but researching properly, like knowing what you're getting into, um, and not to make that sound like in a negative way, but knowing, mm -hmm. oh, if my venue's further afield, that's not necessarily mean your show's not going to work, but knowing that so as you can market accordingly. But I, I'd say mine would be, just because I really felt the benefit when I did it, of just make that relationship as good as possible. Like, it was the time of, that was the one person I would always email as promptly I could. Mm -hmm. Specifically if they were asking for something. Because I was like, if my venue's asking for something, they need it. <laughs> then there's a reason they need to know it. So actually just being, like, making sure those communication channels are open and just treating that as probably the most important relationship that you have, mm -hmm. that's mine, I would say. And if I could throw one in the mix, as if you're listening to this, which is episode three, and you haven't listened to episodes one or two in the series, obviously go back and listen to them. Yeah, even if you've listened to this episode live, listening to back the pre-recorded versions, it still makes complete sense, I promise. And it answers those questions that we may not have covered yeah. today. And, and actually the next, the next we're, we're going on to talk about budget, and budgeting is very important. So actually the budget But first... One, but first, we have, <laughs> if you're coming, if you're a performer from overseas, um, that's going to be um, on the 6th of December. That's going to be um, a bit of a hybrid episode where we'll go, we'll be live to answer any questions, but it's going to be um, a lot of pre-recorded content with um, different members of the team giving advice. I think there's a lot of, uh, sort of technical information, uh, and same actually applies to uh, the last episode of 2019, the calendar year at least, uh, a little Christmas treat in how to budget <laughs> your fringe show, which will be going live on the 10th of December I'm at rapid. 5 o'clock yeah. UK time. Uh, to find out more about any of these episodes, or indeed to catch up with episodes that have already taken place, hopefully you should know the URL by now. It's edfringe.com forward slash fringecast, where you can get the YouTube versions and subscribe to the podcast edition. So that's it for future episodes though needless to say there are a lot more to come in 2020 yep. covering a range of topics such as the practicalities of registering a show which is alan's favorite such a hot topic <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then looking further ahead about marketing and how to make the most of your time in edinburgh uh, but for today's episode just have the final thing we want to cover uh, and it is another plug uh, so <laughs> forgive us for that. Uh, but on social, you can follow us uh, on Twitter and Instagram by following at Ed Fringe, or you can also follow at Fringe Central. That second account is our artist artist focused account. So a lot of its content is exploring these fringe cast sessions and those in person sessions that we are running in the coming months. If you want to look at look into this a little bit more, uh, look at the guide of actually how you bring a show to the fringe, you head to edfringe.com forward slash take hyphen part. And again, obviously, edfringe.com slash fringecast is all the info about that. Finally, what are the email addresses everyone should remember? So I'm going to say it again <laughs> for probably the 17th time this episode. Participants at edfringe.com um, is all of your needs for like really being the primary point of contact if there's if there's an entry point to communicate with the fringe society i would say it's participants at edfringe.com um you'll then probably get passed along the chain as you move on but kevin that goes to straight to your team doesn't it it does it does yeah so we, we pretty much act as a triage service not just during the fringe but but throughout the year um so we're here all all year long um and if 
we don't know the answer to the question. We generally know where to find the answer or where to point you um, in the right direction of that answer. So I would say if, if you are looking for one thing to remember um, in terms of contact details, remember that one. I'm not going to say it again because yeah. you've heard it already. It's participants at edfringe.com. <laughs> um, whereas fringecast at edfringe.com, that's really where we'd like any feedback you have for us. As I say, these sessions are for you. Um, if we want them to work for you. Um, so if there's topics you'd like to cover um, or if you just want to say hello, um, that's always nice too. Um, please do get in touch because these uh, are for you and they wouldn't work without you. And thanks for all of your questions today. So without further ado, thank you for listening. Thank you, Daniel and Leah, for keeping us technically running smoothly. Um, or I assume we have. You haven't looked worried at all, so I'm assuming we are. And thank you very much, Kevin, for being such a font of venue knowledge today. And Thank you. And thank you, Alan, for hosting Thanks. as ever. And obviously to everyone listening in, and we look forward to speaking to you again. Uh, next time we'll be exploring how to perform at the Fringe from overseas. So until then, Great. it's goodbye from See us. See you then. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.